All right. Why don't we do this? Let's start with uh, tell. What's the most beautiful sight you've ever seen? That was a, that was a tough one because like you kind of think back. It'd probably be. I had like a really, and it was I was shooting a photo of it too. It was probably um, the Twelve Apostles in Australia, because um, I'd never really been traveling far, and that was my first like kind of trip where I was like, oh, I'm actually like out of North America, and um, it was kind of mind blowing because we were there later in the day, and it was sunset. It was like a, it was like the stars aligned. It was like a perfect sunset, and you know the Twelve Apostles are beautiful, and the you know the waves crashing, and um, I got a good photo of it. It was on like a five megapixel like old. Kodak, you know, those like point sheets that were like tiny in like the early 2000s. So it's not the, the quality of the photo is not that great, but like, it brings me back and I can like visually remember it. So I think that was probably, like, I love sunsets too. Like I'm a sucker for sunsets. I can like always stare at them. Like, you know, it's so that with 12 apostles is like perfect. So just, that was just quickly, what are the 12 apostles? Yeah. It's those like kind of, um, they're almost like, uh, I don't know what the material is. It's like on the shoreline of, um, of like outside of Melbourne. It's probably north, north, um, I guess, northeast of Melbourne. And it's these kind of like, I don't know if they're like granite rock structures that almost formed a bridge, this like kind of man-made bridge of these arches that were just, I don't know if they were the passing of time or like the, you know, the water levels that created this almost like natural bridge that you can't obviously like go to but then they've always started they've also started to deteriorate so they're these like i think they had like 12 pillars originally that's why they're like the 12 apostles and then they were like connected by this bridge and it was just so weird that it was man-made it looked like a almost like a, like a fluke kind of man-made artistic bridge and and but now there's not even 12 they've all like some of they're constantly collapsing and so i didn't even see the you know like the pure form of it but it was still pretty Pretty amazing. My Viewfinder is a proud member of the Alberta Podcast Network, locally grown, community supported. This episode of My Viewfinder is brought to you by your friends at Telus Story Hive. Since 2013, Telus Story Hive has funded productions and supported emerging filmmakers with mentorship and guidance from the National Screen Institute. The Story Hive program has brought hundreds of films to life from creators in Western Canada. Story Hive is committed to supporting underrepresented filmmakers and stories, which is why we want you to jump on this opportunity. Story Hive's documentary edition is back, and this one is all about local heroes. They're looking for documentary pitches from Alberta residents that highlight extraordinary citizens in your community, big or small. Successful pitches will receive $20,000 and customized mentorship to produce their project. Applications are open until October 7th at 1 p.m. Mountain Time. For eligibility requirements and to apply now, head to storyhive.com. This week, I speak with Tyler Tanner. Tyler is a photographer I met recently who grinds a delicate balance between the camera and the skateboard, part of the first generation skateboard community here in Calgary. Tyler's got some great insight into keeping things airborne and kick flipping through the urban jungle of life. Uh, my dumb puns aside, Tyler's experiences in skateboarding reflect in his camera work and his approach to life. He keeps to core beliefs and ideals, and he suggests not to get too fussed when you inevitably fall face down on the sidewalk. Uh, just get back up, grab your board, and get to moving forward again. Uh, at least that's what I hear when we spoke. Also, he's got impeccable taste in music. Shout out to DJ Shadows introducing maybe the greatest album of a past generation. Here's the first part of my chat with Tyler. That's the other thing, and, and I don't know if we want to talk about that per se without sounding tinfoil hatty, but uh, yeah. yeah, fuck man, yeah, misinformation. I mean, that's the other <clears throat> sort of driving force for this podcast is, uh, yeah, I was feeling pretty disillusioned with taking pictures for a little bit, and then I started asking myself, um, you know, whether pictures themselves are a little poisonous. <laughs> Yeah, no, I I could see that. And I I agree because I you were you on early on Instagram? Were you like kind of in the starting startup of it or not startup? But I joined before Facebook owned it, so uh, probably two thousand and fourteen or something like that, fifteen. Uh, so not early, early on, but um, but when it used to be just 
pictures. That was nice. Yeah, <laughs> it was like the purest content you could get because it wasn't uh, over the top and you got what you got kind of, and it was always enjoyable. Like it was like pretty genuine content, nothing over the top or um, mass marketing or kind of being pushed ideas or opinions. So that was nice. It was like, I do remember when it was at its purest form. I really miss that, but you know, it is what it is, right? Everything evolves in one way or another. You don't know what way it's going to go, but we don't have any control in that, I guess. Eh? Yeah, I guess not. I mean, that, that is the, the key of acceptance. Uh, if I can, whenever I embrace that, I feel better about myself, but, uh, <laughs> no, for sure. Yeah, no, I agree. Like I, um, yeah, cause you can control who you follow and stuff and like kind of tailor your content the best you can, but you're still being forced to sponsored posts that you don't really want to see. And, um, you know, blocking your feed from, you know, your friend's content. Like I follow a lot of skateboarders and, um, yeah, half the time I miss a lot of stuff because like sponsor posts are pushing it down the feed and yeah, my friends will send me something like, oh, you didn't see that? I'm like, no, no, I follow them, but I, didn't, I missed it. So thank goodness for my friends. Like we kind of have a message group and that's kind of keeping the fire up for skateboarding. We are always like passing clips or really cool stuff is being filmed or skate photos and stuff back and forth. So if I miss something, one of my friends will catch it and kind of vice versa. So we're moderating our own content, like stuff we want to see in our own way, kind of. So sometimes we don't have to look at the feed. We're giving it to each other. Like we're giving us the, we all like to have the same kind of style and like the same thing. So we always seem to be able to make sure we, we see what we want to see, luckily. Yeah, I like that. I like the idea of, uh, you know, having a counter, counter influence community uh, by interest to get away from this algorithm. It's, you know, that's become such a hashtagable word, but uh, you're right. I mean, these big corporations, and I'm, I'm a very, uh, I like to point my fingers at stuff, but yeah, the big corporation and the capitalist influence of, uh, you know, yeah, like I said, sponsored by posts, uh, advertisements. Uh, my Instagram feed is a disaster, um, not to uh, point fingers, but doing the other work where I was putting on shows, I got introduced to a lot of young artists and, and that community, which is uh, super cool. But uh, it also put a lot of people on my feed that are, uh, you know, using Instagram in a different way. And uh, yeah, like I'm, I'm 42. I, I don't really want to see 18 uh, year old girls in bikinis or guys like trying to smoke dope or, uh, you know, all this kind of shit. I've been, uh, you know, I, I think people are cool. I'm glad they're embracing the power of this social uh, discourse. I, I hate it. I can't get that engaged in it. And I was actually on a social media blackout until we got connected to Exposure Studio. <laughs> it's the only reason I've come back on Instagram to uh, to like meet you guys. And then, uh, you know, now I'm trapped because I'm actually seeing photographs again. So uh, <laughs> no, it is. It's um, yeah, it's a slippery slope for sure. Hey, yeah. I agree because you're, you're right. There's a lot of content, that, you, you know, it's not like the algorithms aren't perfect, clearly, like not even close because you're right. I'm seeing a lot of stuff that I'm like, this is a, whole, a huge mess. I don't, I like it's not work. It doesn't, you got the wrong audience. It's not working. It's probably frustrating for people getting content they don't want, you know, like I was saying, it pushes away content you do want. And, then, and so you're not only, you know, either getting the right marketing to people or, that you're, or if people want you to follow them, you, it's a miss and you're more frustrating them than anything. Like you're, you're like blocking the content they want to see with stuff that's like pulled by an algorithm that doesn't relate at all, which is, it is, there's like a lot of problems with that I find. And, and even like, I don't want to go off on a tangent and cut into like maybe questions you might ask me, but same with skateboarding, it's got a similar problem. Like a lot of the filmers and skateboarding are like telling their own, the guys are filming or like a team of guys, like on a skate team, like don't, don't post iPhone video on Instagram. Like you're going to ruin your whole video part. Like we've got a full length video that we want to do and you post the trick and you know, the hype is gone. The excitement has gone. And then it's even become a problem now because it's so accessible. Like everyone's got a phone, right? That people will be filming and like a kid has probably innocent intention, but they're excited. They see a pro skateboard and they pull the phone out and they're filming the the you know the professional filmer with the team filming the trick and then they you know it's it's a content driven society now they want to be like first out to be like oh look at this like look what i got and then that alone is out of their control that could you know like uh, really ruin a video too so it's really hard to lock in content i find especially like that's a big problem with skateboarding and and i guess you know you can't really blame the little kids they're excited i was a little kid back in the day and when you see a pro you're just starstruck and not thinking right so it's tough, yeah, because it's so accessible now. Everyone can 
you know, film or take photos so easy that it's, you know, and they have the right to, that's the, the thing too. Like you can't really even get mad because they have the right to, but it's, it's a tough one, right? I guess the, 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 the hard situation with that kind of thing, it's hard to keep your own personal content. Like when it comes to skateboarding or building a project, when you're on kind of on a bigger spectrum, like that with skateboarding that, you know, it is bound to happen, unfortunately, but it is what it is, eh? Yeah, let's talk about that. I mean, uh, we kind of connect uh, through Exposure Studio, but, um, you know, so you're entrenched in the skateboard scene. Are you a uh, Calgarian or are you a transplant? Are you, like, uh, born and raised here? Or? I am, yeah. I was born born in Calgary um, in 83, so I've been here quite a while. Like, uh, I'm, I'm 36 now, so I've been here my whole life. I lived one year... Um, on Vancouver Island in Campbell River for a job. But other than that, I've been in Calgary my whole life. And um, so, yeah, I've been here. I've seen kind of the city develop and change a lot. And um, same with skateboarding. I've been here since, like, you know, skateboarding was kind of in its newest form and gotten bigger. So I've, got, I've gotten to see a lot, luckily, being born and raised here, which is a good thing. You know, you get to really see a lot of change. Yeah, like, what's the skateboard scene been like uh, like how, when did you get in like as a kid because we're i'm i'm 42 but we're i think we grew up essentially in a similar era where yeah i am not to overuse uh, tony hawk's name but like the big explosion of uh, commercial skateboarding happened you know when we were conscious <laughs> uh, and i'm not i'm not uh, a skateboarder but i you know it's such a major major cultural influence for for us um like were you already skateboarding at that time and uh, and like what has it been like in calgary i don't even know what the skateboard scene in calgary is like yeah for sure like like anything though it kind of skateboarding is interesting it has its ups and downs constantly like um it goes in waves kind of uh i started i think i was in first year of junior high so we been like 95 so that was a pretty interesting era for skateboarding like like the you know mid 90s like classic mid 90s it was um tricks were progressing um we had a really big outcast status like you know a lot of people didn't really like skateboarders they were quick to judge like oh you guys are troublemakers wrecking things and like hooligans yeah. yeah, just automatically <laughs> kind of assumed any stereotype connected to a skateboarder that like they might have seen or something. Like it's easy to connect. Um, but my group of friends are really good kids, and we're never into you know we're never into trouble. We're pretty chill. And but yeah, you get that association, right? Like like so you know because we didn't have a. Like, actually, it's funny you say that because like when I started skating, it was um we had one skate park in the city. It was an indoor park. It was all school, which I I love that place. Like that was kind of our our training grounds in the winter. It was like a it was nice because, you know, we get, we can only skate for like six months a year outside naturally. So we had all school, which was a blessing because it was a lot of like a lot of the, the great guys in Calgary, like all the sponsored guys would be there. So you could like sit back and watch and learn tricks and kind of be blown away at the skate park. But then you also had a place to kind of hone your skills. And, and then when the summer hit, though, it got too hot. And then that's the whole outcast us like we were kids right and we were we wanted to skateboard and there was no millennium didn't exist yet we had no outdoor parks which is kind of crazy kids nowadays like are like what because like, the millennium looks so old now but we it wasn't even around when we were skating so we would go to the streets right you, you know you want to go like my mom would go down to eau claire and i was like oh awesome like i'm downtown like you always hear about downtown and it's like the mecca of like the hardcore skateboarders like they're always you see photos like that's how I also like I get concrete powder, which was a Canadian skate magazine. And a lot of the photos you'd see were downtown. So it was like a myth. You're like, Oh, like you're a little kid. So your parents don't let you like, let you go downtown by yourself. So you're like, this place is like crazy. Like guys are skating rails and stairs. I've never seen these buildings before. And then, so when my mom would go downtown, I get pretty pumped. I'd be like, Oh, I'm going downtown. Like, this is amazing. So that really sparked my interest. And then as we got a bit older, we'd all my friends, we'd get, you know, some of them sneak or, ask or beg to like take the bus downtown and we start skating the street and that opened up a whole new world it's like a big skate park except you have security guards <laughs> yelling at you and like you're a little kid you don't really think you're doing anything wrong but you're getting but we've got we got stopped by police we got ticketed by police and when you're a little kid it's pretty intimidating like security like grown men yelling at you and cops you know surrounding you and giving you tickets so it was a bit of a weird world you know pre skate parks it was like you had to you, you, yeah, it was very DIY, right? Like, and, and I think saying that's like the skateboarding's always been DIY. You got to really, you know, you got to really find a way to do it if you, wherever you are, right? You got to make the best out of whatever circumstances you're in. And I think there's a lot of parallels to skateboarding with photography, like street skating is what we did. Like, we had to street skate because there are no parks and then street photography, right? 
a lot of parallels because in street photography, you're always looking for a great shot, right? A great opportunity, something really interesting. And same with skateboarding. We go skiing the street, you go downtown and uh, you look at everything differently than the average person. Like, you know, a set of stairs is to go to walk down or get up to an entrance. But we looked at it as like, oh, something to do a kickflip or the board slide a handrail or something like that. So you, you look at it, it's interesting the parallels between that and photography. Like street photographers look at things in a whole different light than the average person that's not got a camera on them. And same with skateboarding. The minute you got your skateboard on you, you're looking at every obstacle as uh, something interesting that can be utilized and have you know have some have some fun with it. So I think that's that was always what I think really drew me later in life to photography is skateboarding's gone a bit harder is that it's very easy to transition between the two because you always kind of got a bit of an eye from skateboarding at looking at the abstract in an interesting way you know so um yeah it's it's, it's pretty interesting and then um sorry i kind of got off on a tangent but uh no it's perfect is that okay no it's great because you're already doing my job for me i mean we're we're bringing skateboarding and, and uh, photography together and you're giving me sort of yeah a philosophical and psychological sort of uh connection between let's say in your case uh uh, the approach that you developed, uh, being able to go downtown and, and seeing objects as functional pieces as opposed to benign architectural, uh, not even architectural, benign uh, objects in perhaps in your way or functionally to go up and down. Um, and then you've already related it to photography. So, you know, my only direction right now is uh, A, you know, where does photography enter from your skateboarding world? And then B, yeah, let's expand a little bit um, from there uh, about your approach to photography through the lens, uh, shitty, uh, shitty uh, metaphor uh, of a skateboarder. So, um, yeah, you're, you're boarding downtown, uh, you're sneaking or, or bumming rides. Uh, uh, yeah, when does a camera get involved and, uh, and what level are you involved? I mean, you're talking about watching pros, et cetera, like... What what's going on? Uh, what's going on with you uh, in this era? Yeah, for sure. Um, well, I, I think the very first time I really shot skate photos was my dad had um, a point and shoot for work, and I'd always like, grab it. And so I think half his rolls he got back. I think he get developed at Costco back in the day, where like uh, he worked in insurance. It was like properties that were insured. You had to take photos, and then the random frames would be like skate photos he just give me the prints he's like here i think these are yours i don't know like i don't know what you must use my camera so he was really good about letting me take his camera like it wasn't i don't even remember what camera it was it's pretty basic point and shoot um but it's all film too so i've always been big in film i still to this day probably because of that i like film i've got sort of a connection with it and i would remember about probably 96 97 i started shooting like point and shoot just because whenever we go somewhere like my friend would be doing a trick i'm like oh it, you got to get this like skateboarding is kind of built on memories, you know, like, and, and I, and I'm pretty nostalgic. So I like to document. I always have, cause I, I like to have that opportunity to go back and look and remember a time when we were kids and skating. So um, it kind of started with there and then I got a lot better at skating. And then unfortunately, because of that, I was so into skating that I kind of left the camera alone and I didn't pick it up. And I, I was just so into skating that I, um, I just was like, didn't have time to shoot. I just wanted to skate. So it was a bit of a tough one. I took a, like a long hiatus and, and then, um, it was more video at that point. Cause a lot of my friends were trying to make sponsor me videos to send to the Calgary shop. So I was filming a lot. So I would do a trick. My friend would film it and we used a lot of like high aid and, uh, mini DV video cameras back then. So yeah, it was like pretty fun. You know, we'd like tape on a fisheye lens. Sometimes it wouldn't fit. We didn't really know about like filter size and stuff like that. So we just, we like, duct taping fisheye lenses under our camera there'd be horrible vignetting and you know but we didn't really care like i was saying it's diy it's skateboarding we if it got the job done it got the job done so it gave that skateboarding's always kind of had that raw look you know kind of unpolished which has followed me through life i like i don't like too much perfection i like to you know whatever you have whatever your equipment you're using has got to work you know make it work um so about probably from then like probably late 90s to maybe 2005 i was skating a lot and um not just filming friends when they needed it and, and not taking photos and then i went to university and i really slowed down skating and unfortunately like um i got so busy just studying in school that i i really kind of regret it not keeping up on the board because now i've got back into it after school ended and it's just i'm older and it's harder to get tricks back and 
get hurt easier. <laughs> and then because of that, though, it's kind of a blessing because of that. Like I'm older now and I can still skate, but not to the level I used to before. But from all the years of, you know, reading skate magazines, I had uh, subscriptions to Transworld back in the day, Transworld Skateboarding and Thrasher. You know, Thrasher is one of the, the only iconic magazines really that's been around from day one that's still around because you know print and unfortunately is is kind of failing a bit and and um transworld went under so they only run a website now but thrasher i still have a subscription to support them i want them to keep going so i've always had i've always had a subscription i've been always looking at skate magazines so over the years you're just constantly exposed to photography and, and the magazines and the guys that shoot skating are are unreal like they it's just a whole other genre of photography that a lot of people some people don't really get a chance to see but i definitely recommend because um when i was younger 90s was heavy fisheye it's like right in your face like get the lens as close as you can and like you know really get in your face and then um that's never gonna end like i still love fisheye photos and the the whole skate community does too because it's still pretty popular in magazines but they also um a lot of the, it's getting a lot more artistic there's a lot of like almost landscape shots and the skaters film like the bottom third or something very tiny and you it's almost like a where's waldo like the photos are beautiful and amazing you always get so distracted how great it's like a landscape photo or like an unreal photo of downtown just like it just the, the photo itself is amazing and then you you know then the skateboarder pops out so a lot of long lens is used now and it's a little more artistic than it used to be which is really nice it's, it's the creativity has changed like but it still looks great. And um, yeah, after school, and I, I think I, I've really only been taking um, photography really serious for about two or three years now. Like, because back when I was a kid, it, I wasn't really taking serious learning about photography. But this recently with getting back into skating and uh, it's a way to contribute, even though like I can't skate as good as I, I want to. But I remember the joy of, you know, getting photos taken and having those memories. So whenever there's an event, um, nine times skate shop in calgary I, I owe a lot to them because they hold great events at millennium and and uh and it gives you the opportunity to shoot skating because a lot of the times you know you have to be with the crew to to get photos and me and my friends like some of my friends are will let me take photos but sometimes we just want to skate so whenever nine times holds an event it's it's a, a, a blessing because i get a lot of chances to shoot a whole bunch of skateboarders and uh so yeah i'm not too like my dream one day would probably be to get a photo in a skate magazine that's pretty hard work you gotta you gotta take time and you know kind of get get the word out get your name out there so that's kind of on my bucket list of hopefully one day getting a skate photo in a magazine but right now i'm just having fun with it like i think my best photos are are sometimes not even like like skate like genuine like perfect skate photos like someone doing a trick but it's more in, in between like the time between skating i i feel like i've kind of got a bit of an act for that like like you know skating i've gotten a few good skate photos but i feel like the moments between doing a trick or someone like you know prepping for a trick i've, I've kind of got a bit more of a knack for almost like uh candid shots yeah like more like documentary yeah and it's kind of making its way into a lot of skate magazines now like um not so much just trick heavy but like a, a team will go on a tour and they instead of just showing constantly constant tricks they show kind of you know, behind the scenes, what the, what the tour is like, kind of what they're doing. So you get a bit more of a feel rather than just tricks getting forced on you. They, they kind of have a bit of a lifestyle documentary feel to it too, which is really exciting. So skateboard fans get to, um, you know, really experience what going on tours like in a magazine like that. And they get a bit, a bit more of a feel rather than just tricks at uh, parks or local spots, stuff like that. Where to begin? I, you know, it's interesting. You touched on a lot of things. Um, I get, one of my first thoughts speaking to you, uh, sorry, one of my first thoughts listening to you, um, especially kind of both uh, when you're talking about how social media and the current, let's say, filming and people wanting to control the narrative of how they appear, particularly pros and, and either performing hard or new tricks, etc. Um, you know, one of the questions I asked about myself about photography is uh, whether it's... Um, important like is it important to be seen or is it important uh, to just participate in the act of doing it so um you know it does photography have a value if i just click the shutter and throw the camera away uh or does it need an audience and uh, you know I, I think you might be in some position to answer on both accounts like maybe drawing from skateboarding um you know i don't remember the names of uh 
tricks other than you know ollies and stuff like that but you know whatever the uh, kickflips and you know I, i'm i'm basic bud but like uh whatever it is uh, is it important for your, your buddies or a, a wide audience to see that you performed it um there are always small rewards uh, winning that first shot but uh, you know do you need to prove it to other people and then kind of leading on to photography's role in the whole idea of what it you know the value of being seen to do these things uh and so maybe we could start there i mean i don't know what what's your personal thought process around that uh yeah no for sure no that's a it's a great question um i think i think skateboarding does have that but not in um i don't know not in a narcissistic way it's it's like an accomplishment so and it's not even like the the person's obviously proud of the trick they do but um they also the everyone's excited too like i'm excited i see something that now these days skateboarding is just like mind blowing. Like kids are so young and so good and then they're just changing the game so quickly. Like things, it, I remember when we used to play like Tony Hawk as kids, like they're all like kind of laughing, like, Oh, this is like fun, but like no one can do this stuff. And then now kids, people can do the, it's like a video game. Like people can do like video game tricks. It's crazy. But, and with that being said, that the skateboarding is being pushed so hard that there is kind of, um, there's kind of uh, like um, an unwritten rule that like if someone's trying something, someone else shouldn't really do it. You know what I mean? Like, or if someone did a trick at a spot, like it shouldn't be copied and put in a magazine. So that being said, that's why documenting skating is so critical is that guys work so hard and put in the work that they have most like sponsored guys, like the big teams, like even skate shop teams, they have a, a filmer. Like if there's a big trick going down or they go on kind of a mission to get some tricks done, there's usually should be a photographer, like a designated photographer, and someone filming so there's usually like pretty big crews going because it's crucial like if someone hasn't done something before and someone's going to do it documenting it is key um that's for in a general sense and but then there's guys like um there's a famous skateboarder named tom penny he's one of the most chill guys ever like he was destined to be a pro skateboarder but at the same time he wasn't he wasn't in it for fame or attention didn't care if he was being filmed and he was like a mid-90s kind of legend he's still iconic to this day just because he was an anomaly like he just did it for the love but everything followed with him so he didn't care about how much people loved him like he appreciated his fans but he wasn't in it for you know chasing cloud or trying to get you know celebrity status so you get guys like that in skateboarding that's the funny thing is you get it kind of a it's all up to and then you got a lot of lack of control too because you ride for a team and they want like footage is like photos are are not as crucial as they used to be unfortunately because now the magazines are kind of failing right like thrashers out there it's hard to get a photo in a magazine because there's a lot less of them back when i was younger so that's unfortunate for photography is that it's kind of you know it's going on instagram so i'm hoping guys i don't know how it works with the pay but i'm hoping these guys that still take the time to shoot skate photos or you know getting paid well for their photos if they're going on an instagram account for a skate company or but unfortunately, yeah, now that's that's key, right? You got to get out there. Like skateboarding has always been based on like you don't get a pro model unless you're getting out there. A guy can be amazing skateboarder, but if you have to build the following kind of. So once you're sponsored, you got to really put in the work, get photos, get video parts, like stack clips for video parts. If you're not putting that work in, you're kind of it's pretty tough to kind of you know reach pro status and start getting board money stuff like that. So I think that's the integral role of of photography and filming and documenting skating is that even if guys just want to skate for fun, if you want to eventually get paid and kind of a career out of it, you really got to put the work out there. Cause that's how you, you know, you start getting the word out and kids start following you and become fans. So it's so like some of the best skateboarders um, in history have kind of built a brand out of themselves, like kind of how influencers do it on Instagram these days, right? Like they're not just like an account, they're a brand almost kind of right. And like a lot of the guys have done a great job. Like there's a guy like Chad Muska, he was, like a household name he's like he wasn't like tony hawk but he's kind of more of an underground guy like that like all of the guys that were a little more underground skate scene just thought like he just did such a good job of like his personality was great he cared about his fans he did demos he always put 100 percent in. he had like a very outgoing personality and same with the guy josh kalis he those guys have had the best kind of shoe sale board sale success because they were just constantly putting the work in meeting up with filmers getting everything fo like photographed in magazines they just put the work in and their filmers put the work in with them too um so it's, it's a hard it's a hard grind so a lot of those photographers 
at the same time reap the benefits. Like I'm buying a lot of prints off of uh, off of Mike Blavick. He's like one of my favorite ph- photographers. He was for a time like DC's big photographer, DC Shoes. So he was documenting the, the guy I was saying earlier, Josh Kalis Alt Love Park. Like everything he did, he photographed and made sure it was out there, put in magazines, got it out there. And I and still to this day, I, I, I buy prints off them because they're just brings me back to a time when I remember I, yeah, I enjoyed skateboarding the most and I connect with. So um, it's, it's tough because everyone's different. Like skateboarding in general, I don't think it's very narcissistic. Like it's not like they want, they want them to be seen, but they want their, you know, their hard work, like the trick itself. It's not like they want, like, you better see my face in this photo. They, I don't think they care about that. But if their name is associated with the hard work they put in to do some kind of crazy trick that's changing the game, I, they deserve it. And I, I, I to completely agree that they should be, you know, pushing to have that out there because it's, you know, if they don't do it, someone else will do it. And if it's not covered, then they didn't get the credit they deserve sort of thing. It's kind of a tough one with that. Yeah, it's, it's um, and there's not a lot of portraits. Like, I always remember as, as kids, like, um, there are a lot of great skate portraits, but I don't think skateboarders are like always like, oh, I want portrait shots. They always are usually pretty candid and um, they'd rather be skating, right? They don't want to be sitting around getting portraits and stuff like that. So it's not, it's not them being seen. It's more like they want their work being shown, like the hard work they put in and the work they took in to make video parts and tricks is key. Not them as a person, but more of like kind of getting a seat at the table in skateboard history. And, and doing that is make sure, making sure you document all your tricks and, and kind of the work you put in over year, over the years. Here's a quick message from another one of our sponsors. This episode was brought to you by the Calgary Foundation. Whether it's funding anti-racism programs, addiction recovery, or food hampers for the hungry, for 65 years, the Calgary Foundation has proudly supported the charitable community to address some of Calgary's biggest challenges. Now, during this period of unprecedented urgent needs, Calgary Foundation renewed its commitment to building a healthy, vibrant, giving, caring, and resilient community. If you're a registered charity looking for a grant, a professional advisor creating a giving plan for your client, or a donor wanting to give back to community, discover a wealth of resources at calgaryfoundation.org and learn more about their work through Calgary Foundation's Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Like what you hear? Have comments on where I ought to go next? Hit the subscribe button, rate this podcast, spread the word to your friends. Most of all, get in touch with me. Let me know how this is going. Thank you for your attention, and I hope you get as much insight as I do exploring the world of photography.